Hey everyone, we're on the third video of our series on serial bus protocols and today we're going to explore the arcane depths of the UART, so let's get to it. The UART, or Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, may be one of the most venerable technologies still in use today. It was first developed way back in 1960, when Ken Olsen and Harlan Anderson had just formed Digital Equipment Corporation. They hired Gordon Bell to design the I.O. subsystem of their new computer called the Programmed Data Processor, or PDP-1. Bell came up with a circuit design called a line unit which took up a whole circuit board, and digital later condensed down to a single chip device, for use internally on digital equipment computers. The first widely available UART device was released by Western Digital in 1971, and this was followed by a host of devices from other manufacturers. Probably the best known device was National Semiconductor's 8250, which was used in the original IBM PC in 1981, and this device was prolifically cloned by other manufacturers when National couldn't keep up with demand for the device. The successor chip, the 16450, was released in 1984, and that was also a roaring success. These days you can still find UARTs, but they're usually embedded into the peripherals hardware of microcontrollers, and quite often there's more than one available. For example, if we look at the datasheet for the popular ESP32, we find them in the block diagram, and we have three of them in total. Whereas, if we look at the block diagram for an ST Micro STM32 device, we can find six UART or USART peripherals that we can use. We'll get into what USARTs are and how they relate to UARTs later, but for now, let's start by looking at the hardware. UART is a peer-to-peer -peer serial communication protocol that uses two pins, one for transmitting and one for receiving. Fairly obviously, we're going to need to cross-couple our signal lines to get this to work, so the transmit line of one connects to the receive pin of the other UART. This gives us the ability to send half-duplex signals, where each UART will take turns transmitting while the other listens. Alternatively, we can use them full-duplex, where both UARTs transmit and receive simultaneously. Unlike synchronous serial schemes such as I2C or SPI, there is no clock line between the UART devices, so both sides must operate at a predetermined data rate. But, to keep both UARTs at the same reference voltage, we're going to want to share a common ground connection. As you can see, the goal is to take the parallel bytes of data from our data bus and serialise them over a single line to the other UART. To do that, we need a register we can load from our MCU's data bus. From here, it will be put into a shift register to output, bit by bit, onto the transmit line. At the receiver, there's another shift register to collect each bit as it arrives. When the data word is complete, it will go into a receive register, where it can be read by our MCU. To see what that looks like in real life, here's a lattice semiconductor reference design for a UART that's meant to be implemented on one of their programmable logic devices, or PLDs. Starting with the transmitter, we have a transmit hold register that can be addressed from the data bus. This feeds into the transmit shift register, so the data can be sent from the serial out pin. On the receiver side, data from serial in is fed into the receive shift register. When the data word is complete, it gets passed into the receive buffer register, which can also be addressed by our MCU. Some devices will have FIFO buffers here to help smooth out the data flow. As you can see, this design also has a modem controller, along with transmit and receive ready signals that allow for hardware control of data exchanges, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But first, let's look at what's actually being sent. So, UART communication is frame-based, and a frame consists of a start bit, a data payload of 5 to 9 bits, an optional parity bit, and 1 to 2 stop bits. To be clear, that's a maximum of 9 data bits if you don't use the parity bit. If you do, then you have a maximum of 8 data bits, all sent least significant bit first. The construction of the data frame is a relic of the original use of UARTs. It's set up to transfer a single character, a digitised letter or number, like a 7-bit ASCII character or an 8-bit BCD. So it transfers a single character with each frame. That makes perfect sense, because they were originally used by teletypes, or 
teletypewriters to provide the user interface to early mainframes, like the PDP-1, where they would send typed input characters to the computer and receive back characters to print out, originally on paper and then later onto console screens. That's why Linux and other Unix-derived operating systems called terminals TTYs. It's the abbreviation of teletype. Anyway, we've already mentioned that both UARTs need to be configured to the same bit transmission rate. They also need to agree on the size of the data payload, whether parity bits are being used, and how many stop bits are going to be used. The most common setting you'll see is 8 data bits, no parity, and 1 stop bit affectionately known as 8N1 to experienced users. If you are wondering what the parity bit is all about, well, it's a rudimentary form of error detection. The parity bit can be used to form either odd or even parity. Both schemes look at the number of ones in a frame. When using even parity, the bit is set so that the number of ones, including the parity bit, is even. Fairly obviously, for the odd parity, the bit will be set so that the number of ones comes out odd. Using the ASCII capital U as an example, the binary value has four ones in the sequence. If even parity is used, the parity bit will be zero, as there's already an even number of ones. Odd parity will set the bit to one, so that the total number of ones becomes odd. This gives us a chance, at least, to catch a bit being flipped in transmission, and to then take some remedial action. If error-free transmission is critical, especially in an electrically noisy environment, then you would probably want to use a cyclic redundancy check, or CRC, for each complete message, as it's much more likely to catch even subtle changes in the data. OK, so how does this all work at the hardware level? Well, the first thing we need to do is to go back to our UART diagram. One thing we didn't talk about was the clock generator. This is used to generate a clock that's at least 8, but usually 16 times the transmission rate that we want. And we'll see why in just a moment. But I should mention perhaps that traditionally these clock rates were generated using an auto-reloading timer on the microcontroller, driven from the system clock. And this is why devices like the 8051 often had what seemed to be oddball oscillator frequencies like 11.0592 MHz. This is the closest you can get to the maximum of 12 MHz that's readily divisible in the timer settings to get the standard board rates for UARTs. Anyway, the receiver clock is started when the UART is initialised. The data line is high when it's idle, while a start bit indicating a new character is zero or low. The falling edge of the start bit indicates that a new character is being sent, and acts as a timing reference for sampling the bits of the incoming character. The UART will start counting its clock cycles on the next rising edge of the clock after detecting the start bit falling edge. From here, the receiver will count eight clock cycles to find the approximate centre of the bit and take a sample of the data line at this point. If the start bit is still zero, the count will continue. If not, the receiver will assume a false start and will begin looking for a new start bit. Assuming we haven't detected a false start, the count continues another 16 counts to the approximate centre of data bit 0, where the line is sampled for its value, and this carries on for each bit as it comes into the shift register. Finally, the stop bit is sampled at logic 1. The whole process will then resynchronize to the falling edge of the next start bit. Every manufacturer has their own exact take on this, but this is the general gist of what they all do. I mentioned that there are standard board rates, and this is a list of them. You'll probably recognise that the most common value to default to is 9600 board. Beyond that, 19200 and 115200 are pretty commonly used. Although we've been using the terms interchangeably, I suppose it might be worth mentioning that bit rate and board rate aren't technically the same thing. The term board comes from the French telegraphy pioneer Émile Bordeaux, who invented the 5-bit teletype code. Board rate itself refers to the number of symbols transferred per second. As UARTs use binary signalling, 0 or 1, and the signal can only be one of those two options at any given time, then the symbol rate, or board rate, is the same as the bit rate. However, if we were to modulate a signal, say modulating the phase and frequency of the signal so that each symbol carried four bits of data, then for a board rate 1000 board, our bit rate would be four kilobits per second. 
Well, while we're clarifying terms, let's talk about what a USART is. So, USART is an acronym for Universal Synchronous Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Conceptually, the easiest way to think of a USART is as a superset of features on top of what a UART can do. So you can use a USART in exactly the same way that you would use a UART, and it's still pretty common to see them used in this way in a lot of applications. As the name suggests, a USART can also transfer data synchronously. The clock can be recovered from the data stream by the receiver, which won't need to know ahead of time what the baud rate will be. Alternatively, a USART can use a completely separate clock signal line, like this ST Micro USART. When communicating synchronously, you can expect board rates up to about 4 megabits per second with a USART, and you can also use it to communicate using a range of different protocols, such as Infrared Data Association, or IRDA, which was a popular thing on PDAs and laptops into the early 2000s. There's also Local Interconnect Network, which is a 19.2 kilobits per second serial network protocol developed to allow vehicle components to communicate where they don't need faster and more expensive CAN bus interfaces. You have Modbus, which was originally developed at the end of the 1970s for programmable logic devices and is still a de facto standard in industrial applications as it's royalty free and openly published. You can also read smart cards with the ISO 7816 protocol. And of course, we have RS-232 and 485, which you can see the hardware control for in our ST Micro device here. And you can even implement our old friend SPI using a USART. Talking of RS-232, as I said, you can see the request to send output, which can be asserted when the receiver is ready to accept data, and you have the clear to send input, which means the transmitter should continue sending data. These are particularly useful in half-duplex RS-232 communications. On this particular device, the request to send pin is shared with a DE, or Driver Enable, which is used to activate an external RS-485 bus driver. And I suppose this is where some confusion can creep in about RS-232 and UARTs, because UARTs use TTL, or 0 and 5 volt signalling levels. RS-232 levels are very different. Now, RS-232 was originally used for data transfer between DTEs, or data terminal equipment, which would be the computer itself, and data communications equipment, or DCEs, which would be the modem and that would quite often be a few feet away. This modem could then be used to dial up a remote computer to exchange information. That's why you need all these modem control signals between the UART and the modem to automate the procedure. But as I said, the logic levels of RS-232 are very different and were originally designed to minimise any impact of electrical noise. So you're going to need line drivers like the famous MAX-232 to convert between levels. So the UART connects to a line driver which then connects to a DB9, perhaps a DB25 connector for transmission to wherever the signal is going. In RS-232 the logical 1, known as a mark, corresponds to a voltage in the range of minus 3 to minus 15 volts, where a logical 0, or space, is a voltage from plus 3 to plus 15 volts, though the receivers can tolerate higher voltages. And now that you know how RS-232 relates to UARTs, I think that pretty much wraps up what you need to know about UARTs. So, there you have it. And that's it for today. So, all that's left is to say, stay safe and see you soon. Mm -hmm.